Boychik. Glad you're back. Okay, last week I finally enjoyed, I finally enjoyed a session because somebody responded. You guys started talking back to me. Okay. All right, so here's what I want to tell you. Um, I didn't tell you the full story about uh, our discussion, Money Answers Everything. Remember that discussion, people? Do you remember yes. how? Agreed? Yes, yes. You do remember that? Yeah, I do. Okay. Uh, Yaakov Hamishi, you still there? I'm here. You're here? Okay. Feel free to disagree. Okay, so here's what's going on. Um, if you look at verse 19, uh, again, the English says, a feast is made for laughter. Okay, is that good or bad? <laughs> and wine gladdens life. Is that good or bad? Okay, That's good. Everything. You say it's good? Okay. What about Pesach? What are you going to pour into your four cups? Uh, uh, bourbon or, or wine? Wine. D wine it is. Wine, <laughs> wine gladdens life. It's good. At the Seder, you should be having a feast. It's important to have that wine. And it says, uh, feast is made for laughter. Well, you try laughing when all the family shows up, right? A little bit difficult. Not everybody is on board, but I'm thinking of the Seder. Okay, so what's he saying? Money answers everything. We know that's not true, unless you disagree with that. Uh, okay, so to understand what this means, you have to go back one verse. Look at verse 18. What's that talking about? Uh, through slothfulness, the ceiling sags. What in the world is slothfulness? Anybody know? Laziness. Laziness is correct. And through idleness of the hands, the house leaks. Uh, what exactly is idleness? idleness? Anybody? It means not doing what it is you need to get done. You're very good. That's correct. Okay, so in this, in this passage, King Solomon is telling us that it's a shame when people are lazy, because when people are lazy, uh, the ceiling sags, meaning uh, people don't put in the time to fix things, and it's possible the ceiling is going to break down, and, uh, and there's going to be leaks coming into the house. That's very uncomfortable, and that's what's very unfortunate about laziness, but he's going to tell us that as bad as laziness is, there's something to think about which is better than laziness. Now, what this means is that King Solomon tells us there are many good qualities we should have and many bad qualities that we should avoid, okay? And so the question is, which is better and which is worse? Where do you uh, uh, draw the line? So according to the commentaries, King Solomon is saying, if you have to choose between um, laziness or uh, spending your time, uh, you know, um, making parties, meaning money answers everything is where you spend the money on the party. He's actually saying it's better to spend your time with wine and laughter than spend your time being idle and lazy. Now, why would he suggest that that is the case? that uh, why would idleness or laziness be worse than a person going to parties? Oh, you, how? Anybody? <laughs> Come on, let's hear some answers, broken answers. <laughs> I have an idea. Okay, what did you, go ahead, Jeffrey, what, what's your point? Go ahead. Well, because if you're having a party and enjoying something that has meaning, you're doing it for, for something that's meaningful. Good. Uh, lazy has no meaning. You're not right. doing okay. meaning. Very good, very good. So what he's saying is that if a person has to work on improving their, their, uh, their virtues, improving their, their uh, uh, well, I'm trying to, to stay away from the Hebrew for the moment. If a person has to work upon it, perfecting their, the virtues that make them spiritual, he says, uh, okay, in another place, he says, it's better to go to funerals than to, to parties. Right, it, he says it's, he's going to tell us that. But if you have to choose between a lazy person and a person who, who likes to spend money on parties, 
go for the party uh, spender. That's a better situation because a person who is lazy and he's lazy in fixing the roof, uh, at, he's also going to be lazy when it comes to uh, observing mitzvahs. He's going to be lazy in terms of uh, davening. He'll be lazy in terms of any mitzvah that we have in the Torah. And that's really unfortunate. Laziness is one of those terrible, terrible uh, traits that people have. And it's the laziness that really pushes us away from uh, our connection to Hashem. Anybody have a question? Any, anybody want to argue or agree? <laughs> anybody? So cool. uh, okay, so uh, let me just remind you that in our favorite book of the Bible called Exodus or Shamos, when uh, Moses goes to Pharaoh and says, let my people go, what is Pharaoh's response? In Hebrew, he says, Nirpim Atem Nirpim. You guys are a bunch of lazy necks. You're so lazy. That's why you want to go and, and, and you want to go out and have a, a religious feast in the wilderness. He said, the problem with you is you're not getting enough pleasure out of your work. You are lazy and, 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 and therefore I'm going to make you work harder and you'll appreciate it. Unfortunately, some uh, evil people said, Arbeit macht frei. Oh. We know about that, that work makes wow. you free. Hmm. Uh, there were evil who said that. And, and Pharaoh is trying to say that uh, if we weren't so lazy, we would be a lot better off. That was his particular position. But uh, King Solomon is saying is, you know what? You're better off if you're willing to be energetic and make money and even make money for, for, for a party, for a feast, uh, for whatever reason, if, you, if, if making money is going to bring you to happiness and laughter, much better place to be than in the world of laziness, okay? Laziness, is, it, it comes very easy. It's a, it's a human attribute, but it's better to be at a feast uh, and, and, uh, where you will at least have the pleasure of the... Um, the non-laziness, the alacrity that you spend in life achieving uh, your goal, okay? As I said, later on, he's going to tell us that a person is better off going to a uh, funeral than to a wedding. And what would the reason be for that? Anybody want to give me an idea? Why would he say better to go to a funeral than to a wedding? Let's hear some lucky answers. Nobody. The funeral. The funeral is an obligation for people oh. who, who witness a wedding. It's not an obligation, but you have a positive obligation to uh, bury the dead. It's more meaning in a, in, a, in a funeral. Okay, it's true that uh, we have a mitzvah of of, uh, of of being at a funeral, but the truth is, if in the morning davening it says there's a mitzvah to uh, for hachnasa kala, it's a mitzvah to go to a wedding as well that uh, both are mitzvot, but he's saying uh, that when in the world of, uh, of um, virtues, uh, it's, you will gain more by going to a funeral than to a wedding. They're both good things to do. However, he says, well, if you go to a funeral, you're going to realize that life is more serious than you might believe. Because at a wedding, everything is like make-believe. Everybody is so happy. There's feasting. There's uh, Everyone has... Uh, is enjoying themselves. And it is a mitzvah to go to a wedding. There's no question. But in the end, King Solomon feels that so much of our life is vanity. It's, it's called hevel havalim. And as such, uh, he's, he's going to suggest that we go to the funeral if we're in conflict. Actually, he would want us to go to both. But if there's a conflict, uh, we, should, uh, uh, we should really uh, choose to do the more the more difficult mitzvah. Why is it going to a funeral more difficult than going to a wedding? Anybody? Lucky guesses? It's hard. It's hard. Say again. Hard to be sad. Okay, right. We don't want to be sad. We want to be happy. But in the end, uh, both of these are considered great mitzvahs. But he's saying where you're in conflict, it's, it's more important. You're going to get more out of 
uh, of going to a funeral. There you're going to learn about people's virtues, what their good deeds are, what they achieved in life. In fact, uh, one of the things that King Solomon will tell us is better is the, uh, is the end of the story than the beginning of the story. Now, what do you think he could mean by that? Anybody? Better the end than the beginning. Uh, we have a nice, um, we have a nice woman who's in our in our group. Uh, could you speak up, please? I forget your name. She's not there. <laughs> what, what, what exactly? What exactly um, do we achieve? And nobody wants. Okay, people, you're supposed to argue or agree or disagree. Okay, nobody wants to speak up. Okay, well, uh, King Solomon's point of view is vanity of vanities, meaning we spend too much time doing things that have no spiritual value. And if we want to uh, be spiritual, uh, which is the best place to be, you have to make certain decisions. Again, uh, you might want to turn to Pirkei Avos, to the ethics, where Hillel makes a very interesting statement, which some people misunderstand. What does that possibly mean? Jack, I'm if sure I'm not, you know that. If I'm not for myself, who will be? Who will be for me, right. And what does he mean by that? He means when it comes to your own spiritual growth and interests, if you don't take responsibility for yourself, nobody can do it for you. Meaning, uh, if you say to somebody, I'm, uh, I'm too tired, why don't you go to shul for me? Do me a favor, you be, represent me in shul. Is that really a possibility that somebody can daven for you? Not really, not really. You have to do these things. You can't say to somebody, you give charity, and uh, because, you know it'll be my mitzvah. Now you could do that, if you give them money for charity, but if you just say, uh, think about me when you give charity or tzedakah, you really are not looking out for your own best interests, okay? That's, that's Hillel really paraphrasing the words of, uh, of King Solomon. Oh, I, did I tell you, if you look in the beginning of the book of Kings, Kings 1, the story of when King Solomon becomes the king of Israel, it, it tells us that he prayed to God for, for uh, help. He was, uh, he was very young. He was afraid he wouldn't know how to judge the people properly. So he asked God to give him the wisdom to judge the people. And uh, he has a dream. And at the end of the dream, he realizes God has answered his prayer. And the next story is what we all know about, about the two women, remember, who uh, are arguing over which, babe, which one is the mother. We've, we've discussed this before. And King Solomon has no evidence at all to indicate one way or the other who is the real mother. There were no witnesses. There were no papers, nothing at all. And remember what he does to uh, to determine who the real mother is. Anybody, Jeffrey? Are you familiar with the story? No. Okay, uh, Jack, help me out. What happened? Yes, he says to uh, that he's going to kill the baby. And, well, uh, uh, but when he, he says to... that he's going to kill the baby. The uh, one who's a fraud says, "Go ahead." And the one who is not said, said, "No, don't." I'd rather give it to the other woman. Okay, very good. Now, the only thing that you left out, Jack, was it wasn't just killing a baby. He was going to kill the baby religiously. He's going to give, give him a clop with a sword. <laughs> what, uh, what he was going to do is uh, he seemed to know a Mishnah that we've all familiar with. There's a very famous Mishnah that says, with two people come to court, each one claiming to be the owner of a, an object that they found, uh, we make them take an oath that they're telling the truth, and we divide the object up between the two of them, right? Or like a, a garment, we sell it, or we, if they want, we could cut it in half. So King Solomon is saying, well, according to the Mishnah, I think we're supposed to just cut the baby in half and give one half to one woman and one half to the other. Sounds like a religious idea. 
Uh, but as you said, Jack, uh, the baby isn't going to survive if you cut it up, right? So uh, what he did is he managed to get the real mother to show her that she was the mother because the real mother said, no, I don't, I don't want the baby killed. And the other woman said, no, it's fair. Um, half for her and half for me. So he knew and told us that we could see this was the beginning of wisdom that, that God gave him. And if you look in chapter five of Kings one, and you could look at it in the English or any language you like, it's going to tell you that God blessed King Solomon with wisdom greater than Moses and greater than Father Abraham and greater than the people uh, of the wilderness who, uh, who learned the Torah for 40 years, that the, his wisdom was going to be superior to all of them. And this was going to be very helpful in terms of the books he writes. How many books did he write? Anybody know? Anybody know how many books King Solomon wrote? Lucky guesses? Don't be afraid, people. How was it was it three of them? Kohelet? Yes, tell me your name, please. I forget it. Okay, uh, Wilt, Debbie Wilt. Oh, Debbie, okay. Right, it's right. Debbie. Okay, Hi, good. Debbie. I'm glad you're here. I think, Co I think Kohelet was one. And then uh, was Mishlei the other one? Yes, we're good. learning now. Okay, and there was one other one. I can't remember. <laughs> There's, that's right, that's two. And there was one more. <laughs> Anybody want to ve venture a guess? Mm. Okay, it's called Shir Hashirim. All oh, right, right, right. The Song of Songs. And, uh, and, and, and Rabbi Akiva, the greatest rabbi of the Talmud era, said that uh, the Song of Songs is the holy of holiest, that it is on such a spiritual level that we can't even begin to understand it. It's the Song of Songs is a love story between Hashem and the Jewish people under difficult circumstances uh, when Jews are in, 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 in Galut, which means in, in diaspora, uh, how the relationship goes back and forth. And um, so King Solomon had this amazing wisdom. And uh, you know the story of the Queen of Sheba? Anyone hear that story? It's also mentioned in Kings. Mm -hmm about a woman. Uh, she uh, heard about his wisdom and she came from a faraway land and gave him many, many gifts because uh, she could not believe that he, he knew all this. It, it, was, it, was, it was almost inhuman to have this information. How could he know so much? But as I told you, it says that God gave him the wisdom because he prayed for it and God said, okay, let's see how you de do, deal with it. So here's the question. Now that, that he has incredible wisdom, and we, we'll see this wisdom in, the, in these three books, um, the question is, does he make any mistakes with all that wisdom? Does he make any mistakes with the, his incredible wisdom? Anybody know the answer? I'll try that. Well, when he marries um, Paro's daughter, the Queen of Sheba. Yes. So, I mean, uh, they all um they were big idol worshipers i think okay. and and uh, I, that in a way i think belittled shlomo maybe a little bit of that kind of rubbed off on him in okay. in some way yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. okay debbie that's excellent we're okay. going to see that if we go through the entire uh, torah or tanakh yeah. okay or through the entire talmud you will not find any one human being no matter how spiritual that every one of them uh, ha has committed a mistake okay we call it a sin it's not because they were trying to break the law it's just that it's very difficult to know what you should do in any given situation I don't know. for instance uh, do you remember when God speaks to Moshe on the mountain and tells him he must save the Jewish people mm -hmm. remember that and remember how Moshe says no find somebody more worthy. I, I don't have the gift of speech. Remember how back and forth, right. finally God convinces Moshe to, to accept his uh, responsibility. Okay, that's wonderful. Uh, now Moshe is now on a very high spiritual level. He's a prophet, he speaks with God. And the next thing that happens is uh, he's, he's taking his wife and uh, two children to Egypt. He's taking them with him. And he has the obligation to circumcise uh, his uh, older child. Right. 
And what happens? Does he do it? He didn't he actually, do it. He does not do it. Who does it? His, His wife, wife Tepora. Right, so Tepora does it because she realized that he had made a big mistake. Now he did not make a mistake to be uh, because he was lazy, uh, or because uh, he had something uh, else in mind. He just thought that if God appointed him to save the Jewish people, he better get to it immediately and let the baby, you know, he'll take care of the circumcision at a later time. Mm -hmm. But that was a mistake that he made. Okay, yes. not that he he was uh, lazy. He just felt that this was what God would want him to do, and he made a mistake in the process, okay? And everybody, in fact, recently in the, in the Talmud, there's a story about the great Hillel, who's one of our greatest uh, saints, <laughs> if I may use the word. He's, he is uh, somebody we turn to with the greatest respect. Uh, he was a great, great leader of the Jewish people. And the Talmud has, tells us that he made a mistake uh, uh, by he, he insulted a lot of people for not knowing the ruling when it comes to uh, bringing a, a, a Passover sacrifice on Shabbos. They didn't know it, and, and he was so upset that they didn't know that because he felt they had studied under the greatest rabbis in the world, Shmaya and Avtalion, and, and for them not to know the, uh, the ruling um, was, was something that was a big mistake on his part. And, and then when they said to him, well, uh, okay, we really don't know, but you must know the answer. He, he said that he, he didn't remember. It was like God punished him for, for, for you know, talking down to the people. And, and he didn't, and he, in the end, he said, you know, um, I really don't remember what the ruling would be. However, he says, the Jewish people are, even though they're not prophets, they're descended from great people, and they will automatically know what to do in Jerusalem. They'll know exactly how you go about preparing the animal for Pesach while it's still Shabbos. And they did exactly the right thing. But my point simply is, you cannot find anywhere in the Tanakh anybody who managed to hit 100% uh, without ever making a mistake. Okay, mm -hmm. it just doesn't happen. Um, does anybody want to challenge me? I'll be happy to take. Who? Give me an example of somebody who you think never made a mistake. Anybody? You're too good to me. <laughs> You're making my life too easy. Come on, you can challenge me. Come on. Everybody makes mistakes. <laughs> That's <laughs> like a heavenly voice. That's, <laughs> That's good. Everybody makes mistakes. Why? Because if you're human, you make mistakes. Uh, what about the great uh, prophetess Deborah? Remember her? I'll devour her. Yeah. Is that your Jewish name, Debbie? Yes, Devourer. Right. Okay, so recently we read a Haftorah, right? About uh, in, in the book of Judges, chapters four and five, about Devorah was the prophetess of the people. And um, she, at a certain point, was uh, overly proud of the fact that she was the leader of all the people. And she referred to the fact that she was like the mother of all of the Jewish people. Mm -hmm. You know, Kamti Aimba the Israel. And and she just sort of went a little bit too far with her pride. And the next thing that knew is that happens is she says, Uri Devora, Uri Uri Dabri Shir. All of a sudden, she lost her gift of prophecy. Wow. Why? Because she went a little too far with her achievements. Okay, so pride is not something that we're supposed to do. We're supposed to be humble, and uh, we are. But occasionally, we go too far, and um, and that the, that's the study of Judaism. Um, when we say on the high holy days. Uh, we and our ancestors have sinned. Uh, anyone know the words in Hebrew? Anachnu. Jack, you remember that? Anachnu. I don't remember. Va'avotenu. Does that come back? Chatanu. We and our. What, what, what are we saying? We're saying that even though my great great grandfather had a long, long beard, right? And, and he did not watch the Super Bowl, <laughs> he too was less than perfect. 
but you wonder how could he not be perfect? I mean, he he he, he you know he didn't uh, go to the nightclubs, right? He uh, he seemed to go to shul every day. How is it possible that that we could say that our ancestors committed sins? The answer is, as Jack was saying, uh, if we're human, even when we try to be perfect, we can't achieve perfection. But at least we can try, right? And if we make a mistake, what do we do next? What's the answer to making a mistake? We thought something was okay and it really wasn't. You repent and you correct it. Okay, and is there a link in Hebrew or in the Torah where you correct your mistake? It's called teshuva, right? Debbie, you've heard of that? Right. Yes, yes, yes. Right. Okay, teshuva is repentance. And um, the, the, uh, the Gemara says that God created the, um, the gift of repentance before God created the world. And the question is why? Uh, the answer is because God knew every human being would need to turn to teshuva or repentance because we don't have the gift of being perfect, okay? It's, in fact, uh, if you look in the book of Job, Eov, uh, it says that God has no trust even in the angels. Wow. Mm. Even the angels who are so different than human beings, right? They don't have any of, of the urges that, that we have. No. Uh, right? They're not right. tempted to uh, eat meat and milk. They're not, not, not tempted to insult one another. Even they uh, are not quite where they should be. That God can't trust even the angels to, to, to do the job right. Okay, what's an example? Does anyone know an example where the angels got into trouble? Anybody? You can take a lucky guess. Okay, I'll give you an example. When God sends the angels to protect uh, uh, remember a lot, remember uh, in the city of Sodom, remember where God sends angels to take, uh, save Lot and his, uh, and his family, right? Because God was going to destroy oh. Sodom for their evil. So when the angels come to, uh, to Lot, they say, we are destroying this city. You have to get out of here in a hurry. And the, the, the Talmud says they weren't really destroying the city. They don't have the ability to do that. God gives them the ability, but it's really not their achievement. It's God's achievement to do that. So uh, they got into big trouble. Uh, oh. They were rejected from being a part of those angels that pray to God every day. Okay. And they, they didn't like that because for angels, not uh, praying to God is very painful. And yet they were excluded from those uh, mm. the angels that would pray because they were doing something that's very human. They were taking too much credit for themselves when it came to uh, obeying God. Okay, very important to, to know these things. And so mm. what uh, King Solomon is reminding us is there are many kinds of virtues that we can achieve, uh, many things we should want to do, and many that we should avoid doing. Okay. And so far, he's telling us it's better to, uh, to work hard and make lots of money and have uh, parties than to be so lazy that you're not only lazy uh, when it comes to fixing your house, you're too lazy to go to shul. You're too lazy to, to, uh, you know, to buy matzah for Pesach. You're, you know, everything goes downhill. So it's better, he says, to, um, to, to work hard, make money throw parties, make, make a Seder, do whatever you need to do, that's better than laziness, okay? And, uh, but once we get to making parties because we're not lazy, then we have to make other choices in life. And uh, the truth is, whether you're going to a, a wedding is a mitzvah, going to a funeral is a mitzvah, and you just have to know which is the more important one to attend to. Okay, and that is something that everyone in, in the entire Bible has made mistakes with, thinking this is what they were supposed to do. And because of human error, they made mistakes. And it's not the end of the world to make a mistake. Okay, we can correct it. Uh, what do we say on Yom Kippur? It's much harder to, to, uh, to, to uh, do repentance for a mistake we made with a human being than with Hashem. Why is that? Oh, God. Oh, no. 
Okay, why is that true? That um, that it's harder to get re uh, uh, repentance for uh, a sin, like if you stole money from somebody. Uh, why is it? Uh, why is that a much worse sin than uh, not praying at a certain occasion? Anybody? No. Oh. Okay. The answer is, when you steal money, for instance. Uh, you you have uh, offended God. God doesn't want you to steal, correct? But you also offended uh, the fellow you stole from. So in the end, when you uh, tell God that you're sorry, and uh, it's not enough to say you're sorry, you have to not only return the money that you stole, but you have to ask the person to forgive you for this for the aggravation they had, knowing somebody had stolen their money. Uh, any any questions on this? Mm -hmm. Okay, that's why the Ten Commandments are divided into two groups. Uh, the first commandments are about you and Hashem. And the second uh, tablet is about you and your fellow human beings. And uh, we have mitzvot that we must follow when it comes to Hashem. And other mitzvot when it comes to our uh, fellow human beings. Uh, in the second uh, uh, tablet, we have do not steal, do not murder, right? Do not uh, act... Um, do, do not act uh, falsely in court. All of these things are human behaviors and um, we just have to try and do our best. Okay. Okay. So we're going a little further um, and look at chapter 11 where it says, send your bread upon the waters. After many days, you will find it. Uh, okay. What do you think he might be referring to in this? We're going to finish up in a moment. What does King Solomon mean when he says, send your uh, bread upon the waters? Okay. Now, there are many ways. He, he speaks, you know, there's many ways to understand these things. It, it's not just one correct answer. There are many answers. But what, what, what is the mitzvah we have when we have bread? What should we do with our bread? Wash. Wash, right. Okay. What else? What other mitzvah can we do besides wash? Hamotzi. Right? We can Hamotzi. Good. Uh, anything else that I'm leaving out? You can do uh, uh, throwing away your sins. Okay. Right. Very good. <laughs> right? That's, that's good. What about sharing your food with somebody else? Would that be a mitzvah? Would you think that's a mitzvah when you share your food? Sure. It really is. What if the person is poor and you and you give them your bread or your food to, to eat it because they don't have any food for themselves? Is that a big mitzvah? Yeah, if you yeah. don't embarrass them when you, yes, you don't embarrass them when you do it. Right, right, right. However, tzedakah, that's what we're talking about. Send your bread upon the waters is about giving tzedakah. And as Maimonides says there are eight different levels of giving tzedakah properly. He says, when you share your bread with the poor. After many days, you will find that bread, meaning you will find that you are rewarded by God for, for your mitzvah of looking after the poor. Okay, so that's what he means. Share, uh, send your bread upon the waters, meaning if anything that's on the water, it, 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 it seems to disappear. And he says, no, 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 it doesn't disappear. Whatever you did when it came to tzedakah will always come back to your advantage. Okay. And we'll find in another chapter, he says that when you give tzedakah, God rewards you with a longer life. Okay, that, uh, why is that? Because the poor sometimes are so, are so poor that they might die from hunger. When you give them money or food, you're saving their lives. So in, so in turn, God will save your life or give you additional uh, years because of your mitzvah, okay? So okay. these are these are things that King Solomon is saying. Um, uh, look at the next part of the uh, of uh, number one. Distribute portions to seven, even to eight, for you never know what calamity will strike the land. What do you think he means? What could seven refer to? Distribute portions of food to seven. What could seven refer to? The seventh day of the week. Could he be referring maybe to Shabbos? Be sure that the uh, certainly 
if there's any time that we need to be concerned about the less fortunate, it's on, on, on Shabbos, on Sabbath. And he says, if you distribute a food so that the poor have what to eat, or even to eight, eight is the day after Shabbat, that's a weekday, makes no difference, but first try be sure people have enough for, for Shabbat. And then uh, this is very important because things happen to everybody that we never expect. But this mitzvah is going to protect you from these calamities. Okay, that's what King Solomon is trying to share with us. Okay, we're going to finish up very soon. Does anybody have a question, an observation? Uh, please feel free to speak up. Um, there's no, no problem, you know, no, you will not be admonished or castigated for saying anything. Anybody have a question? Please. Oh. Okay, uh, the great Hillel said that um, if you're bashful, you won't be able to learn. And if the teacher is too strict, uh, he won't succeed in teaching anybody because he scares everybody. So would you want me to be known as the strict teacher? You want to scare all you guys? <laughs> all right, so I scared you. Okay, I'm worth this mask should scare you. It scares me. <laughs> that's what that's what you should be. But you're supposed to speak up. You're supposed to share your knowledge. Uh, you know, in Judaism, you don't learn just getting information. You learn by trying to work with the information, questioning it, adding to it, uh, distribute. You know, taking it uh, up and down. And uh, so this is what uh, what it's all about. Okay. So I hope you can join me next week. And if you have any questions that you want to write down. Uh, even if it's not referring to, but just anything in the Tanakh, why don't you just bring the question on a paper and ask me, maybe I can help you with it, okay? So, okay. Um, uh, it's good to see all you nice people again. Want to wish you a lovely day, and uh, yes. my yarmulke has a letter B on it. What does B stand for? <laughs> Boychik. Boychik is right. What else could the B stand for? <laughs> Orchard. Say it again? Never mind. Boychik and <laughs> Boca, Boca Raton, or th that Jewish uh, football player, if his name was Brody, but it's Brady, so I guess he's not Jewish. Uh, okay, what else? It could stand for, the B could stand for the last Parsha of Bashalach, right? The story um, uh, when the Jewish people leave Egypt. Uh, it, it can stand for for Rabbi Yaskur, right? Rabbi Benjamin Yaskur, the B. Look at this. I'm, I'm celebrating everybody and everything. So anyway, have a wonderful uh, rest of the day, everyone. Come back in good health and uh, please bring your questions, okay? Zygazint, have a wonderful, wonderful rest of the day. Okay, thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.